Hello everyone, welcome back to Dedekind Charts. Today, we will be taking a look at two number theory problems from the IMO 2022 shortlist, which was just released a couple of weeks ago. We will be taking a look at N2 and N8, and even though N8 may sound like a difficult problem, it can actually be dismantled with a two-line proof that uses some advanced number theory concepts, so you won't want to miss that. Without further ado, let us take a look at N2. So for n2, we are supposed to find all positive integers n greater than 2, such that n factorial divides this complicated looking product on the right. So this product we are supposed to look over all p less than q less than or equal to n, where p, q are primes, and then we put p plus q into the factor. So to give an example, if n equals to 8, all the primes less than or equal to 8 are 2, 3, 5, and 7. So if we list all of the possible outcomes, uh, we are supposed to just take the product of these six terms here. Okay, so when faced with a problem like this, usually it's, it's uh, helpful to consider the what I call the extreme cases. So if we let p1 to pm be the primes less than or equal to n, in this case we are going to take a look at the largest prime and see if it tells us anything useful about n. So pm appears in the n factorial here, which means pm must divide the right side, which means pm divides some pi plus pj. Okay, and the useful thing about uh, having chosen the largest prime is it seriously bounds what is the possible outcome here. So what I mean by this is if we think, think about how large can pi plus pj be, Obviously, even if you take the largest prime, which is pm, and then you take the second largest prime, which is less than pm, you will definitely end up with something that is less than 2pm. So this divisibility condition forces, uh, can only be satisfied if pi plus pj is actually pm itself. So we reach a conclusion that pi plus pj equals to pm for some i and j. And pm is uh, at least 3 in this case. And this is an odd number. You cannot have odd plus odd equals odd. So this equality can only happen if this is two, one of them is two and the other one is pm minus two. So this forces pm minus two to be prime. Now, the natural question then is can I repeat this line of reasoning again and roll downwards? So not a problem because pm minus two appears in the n factorial. So pm minus 2 again divides some factor on the right. So it divides some pk plus pl. Now, once again, if you look, look at the, how big this uh, sum can be, at most pm and then at most pm minus 2, right? So this thing is less than or equal to 2pm minus 2. In this case, there are actually two uh, scenarios now on what the multiple can be. So it can either be exactly pm minus 2 itself, which is here, or it can be twice of pm minus 2. So we again reach this conclusion, which looks a bit more cumbersome now, but it turns out that it again will force pm minus 4 to be a prime. So let's take a look at this. In the first case where the two primes sum to pm minus 2, again this is odd, we can have odd plus odd equals odd, so it must be the case that one of the primes here is 2, and the other one will have to be pm minus 4. So it forces pm minus 4 to be prime. In the second scenario, let's consider what happens if the larger of the two primes here is only at most pm minus 2, then the other one will be strictly less than pm minus 2, and you cannot have the two of them sum to twice of pm minus 2. So it must be the case that the larger of the two primes here is actually pm, and then the other, the other number is therefore forced to be pm minus 4 in order to reach this sum. So again, we force pm minus 4 to be a prime. So now that we have these three conditions here, pm, pm minus 2, and pm minus 4 being prime, notice that one of them must be congruent to 0 mod 3. So how can a number be prime but divisible by 3? That only happens if that number is equal to 3 itself. So this means that the three numbers here must be 3, 5, and 7, which means pm must equal to 7. So once we have the largest prime being 7, this tells us that n must be 7, 8, 9, or 10. And it's now a matter of checking that n equals to 7 works, but 8 uh, doesn't work. So 
uh, if 8 factorial doesn't divide this, neither does 9 factorial and 10 factorial. So this is our final answer, n equals to 7. So I hope you found this number theory problem uh, fun. And without further ado, let us take a look at problem n8, which is where the fun begins. So for n8, we have a really short problem. We need to prove that 5 to the power of n minus 3 to the power of n is not divisible by 2 to the power of n plus 65 for any positive integer n. A short and succinct problem. And turns out there is also a short and succinct solution. Uh, but before going to the solution, I would like to first cover some background for those who might not be very familiar with what we are going to be using. So we are going to be looking at something that is called a uh, Jacobi symbol. And before even going to that, let's have a quick recap of what the Lagrangian symbol is for those who might not be as familiar. So the Lagrangian symbol is basically defined as follows. So if we have P being an odd prime and A being an integer, then we have this symbol here, we just write bracket a over p. But this is not a fraction, it's just a symbol. And it's equal to 1 if a is not a multiple of p, but a is a quadratic residue. So quadratic residue means that there's a x such that x squared is congruent to a mod p. So it encodes 1 if it's a quadratic residue, minus 1 if it's not a quadratic residue. And then there's a h case where if p divides a, then we just uh, define this to be 0. Okay. Uh, so it's basically an indicator of whether a number is a quadratic residue or not. And there is a direct way you can compute it actually. There's this formula, uh, which I show on the right. Uh, I will go into the proof of why this formula works, but uh, it's useful to uh, keep in mind, learn this formula as well. And there are two properties that we actually need of the Lagrangian symbol, which we will generalize for the Jacobi symbol. And the first one is, is multiplicative in uh, the, the top symbol. So uh, we have this expression over here. This is quite easy to prove once you uh, apply this formula. And then the more interesting uh, formula, which is called the quadratic reciprocity law. So this is an absolutely beautiful uh, law. I think it's proven by Gauss if I'm not wrong. And basically, if we have P and Q being distinct odd primes, we can actually relate Q over P to P over Q by using this very simple formula over here. So this is uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, the proof might be a bit more complicated, but it's again a result just useful to keep in mind. So now let's take a look at the generalization, which is uh, called Jacobi symbol. And I'm just going to show the analogy uh, because uh, I won't have time to go over all the proofs, but uh, the analogy is quite easy to understand. So in this case, instead of just being a prime in the bottom, we now extend it to n being a, any odd positive integer. So if we write n with this prime factorization, then we can define the Jacobi symbol a over n to be this product over here. So basically, we do the Lagrangian symbol uh, for each prime that appears in the prime factorization. So p1 appears a1 times, then we do this a1 times. We multiply uh, all the results together, and this will give the Jacobi symbol. And the question, natural question is, does this still encode something about whether A is a quadratic residue or not? Uh, is this just something useful to keep in mind that actually it only captures the quadratic residue interpretation partly? So uh, in this case, we have we still have the result that if A is um, not divisible by any of the primes, and if A is a quadratic residue, then a over n is still 1, but the converse does not hold. Okay, so just be very careful about that. Um, but we won't need this fact for this, um, or this interpretation for this problem. We just need to keep track of the generalization of these two properties here, which I shall now go over now. So we still have the multiplicative uh, property, and in fact, it holds from both the top and the bottom. So we have uh, this multiplicative in the top, multiplicative in the bottom, and this is quite easy to prove by just going through the definition and using the multiplicative property here also. And for the quadratic reciprocity law, we have the fully generalized uh, formula. So if m and n are co-prime, odd and positive, odd positive will ensure that these are defined. Co-prime is just the uh, generalized way of saying that they are distinct from previously. So now it's co-prime. And then we again have m over n times n over m equals to this 
expression here. So it's very easy to compute what one term is in terms of the other. In particular, if uh, at least one of m or n is congruent with one mod 4, then we will get this is 1. Then m over n will be same as n over m. Okay, so this is very useful to keep in mind. So now that we have covered the theory that we need on Jacobi symbol, we can now see how to dismantle this problem N8 uh, in just two sentences. So uh, are you ready? Because N8 is supposed to be the hardest problem on the shortlist, but here goes. So the first sentence is we can check that N must be odd because indeed if N is even, then uh, let's take a look. If n is even, this thing will be congruent to 0 mod 3. It's quite easy to check. So 3 divides this, but 3 certainly does not divide this. So that would be a problem. We cannot have uh, this end up dividing 5 to n minus 3 to n. So we force n to be odd. And you might think, okay, this is only barely making any progress. Uh, and I mean, after you conclude that n is odd, it's very also very easy to check that n cannot be equal to, n equals to 1 does, just doesn't work, right? You have 2 uh, also doesn't divide this. So if there's any possible solution, n must be odd and n must be greater than or equal to 3. And the second sentence is, if we assume on the contrary that uh, we have some n that satisfy this divisibility condition, in other words, 5 to the n is congruent to 3 to n mod uh, this thing, then it means that firstly, the Jacobi symbols must evaluate to the same thing, right? Because uh, you can just take a look at the definition. If the two, two terms are equal to each other under the mod, then the Jacobi will evaluate to the same thing. And now let's evaluate what the Jacobi symbols are on the left and on the right. So on the right, by the multiplicative property, this thing is uh, this thing to the power of n. But using the fact that n is odd, we know that whether it's 1 or minus 1, if you pair up, uh, like you take the square, you will definitely be equal to 1. So if you pair up the terms, they will all cancel out to 1. So uh, the sign of this, whether it's 1 or minus 1, depends on just the last term, whether this individual term is 1 or minus 1. Okay, and then now, we using the fact that n is odd, we can check that this thing is... Uh, actually not using the fact that n is odd, rather using the fact that n is greater than or equal to 3. So uh, 4 will divide this, and this is congruent with 1 mod 4. So this thing is congruent with 1 mod 4, which allow us to apply the quadratic reciprocity law in a way that says this will be equal to this. So now that we flip this around, it's quite straightforward. 3 is just a normal prime here. Uh, the top is congruent to 1 mod 3, and... Therefore, if we ask ourselves, is 1 a quadratic residue of 3? Yes, it is, because uh, 1 square is 1, for example. So this right side evaluates to 1. And now let's look at the left side. So similarly, because uh, n is odd, we have this thing is equal to this to the power of n. And if you pair up and cancel up, the fact that n is odd means you leave 1 over. And then again, uh, because in fact now 5 is congruent with 1 mod 4, we can apply the quadratic reciprocity and flip this around without any change in sign. And then the question is, 5 is just now a uh, normal like prime. Is this a quadratic residue mod 5? So because n is odd, you can check that the top evalu evaluates to congruent to mod 2 or 3 mod 5. And 2 nor 3 are quadratic residues mod 5. So this evaluates to minus 1. So we have minus 1 equals to 1, and this gives a contradiction. And that is all to the proof of problem N8, which is really funky, and thankfully it's not selected as like the P6 of the IMO 2022, because that would just be like a complete disaster, where like a whole bunch of people who are familiar with Jacobi symbol would just end up getting 7 points, uh, assuming that they can find this proof. So what do you think of these two uh, number theory problems? Hope you learned something from this video. Stay tuned to the channel for more math videos and see you soon.